in every sunrise the colors of the morning are inside your eyes the world awakens in the light of the day i look up to the sky and say say church you're beautiful power in the moonlit night where planets are in motion and galaxies are bright we are amazed in the light of the stars it's all proclaiming who you are you're beautiful Every day 
for the beauty of the Lord. Jesus, your love has come one step closer. I will trust that you will never let me go. Your love has won me over all my trust, has found no other. So I will declare the beauty of the Lord, nothing compares to the beauty the Lord and Jesus your love it takes my breath away now I'm living every day for the beauty of the Lord the beauty of the Lord Jesus your takes my breath away just you Jesus your love takes my breath away and Jesus your love takes my breath away and Jesus your love takes my breath away and Jesus your love it takes your love it takes my breath away Jesus your love it takes my breath away Jesus your love it takes my breath away so I will declare the beauty of the Lord nothing comes the Lord and Jesus your love it takes my breath away now I'm living every day for the beauty of the Lord so I will declare the beauty of the Lord nothing compares to the beauty of the Lord your love it takes my breath away now I'm living every day for the beauty of the Lord the beauty of the Lord give him praise church let him know how much you love him today Hey, do yourselves a favor. Maybe not shake a hand because of the bug that's going around, but turn around to somebody and say good morning, would you? Well, it's good to be in the house. We're going to continue to worship the living God this morning. We're going to do so, give you an opportunity to worship by giving. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the boxes on the, on the way in. They each have a sign. And uh, bad pastor, I can't remember the, the scripture, but you can notice it on your way out. But it says each of you must decide in your own heart. How much to give and not to do so under pressure we want you guys to know if you're here today and you're new there's no pressure to give this is something between you and the Lord but we want to pray we want to say thanks to God for his provision in our life 
Would you join me in prayer in doing so? Father, again, thanks for the practical things. Thank you for this house, your house. Uh, it's such a privilege to come here week after week, Lord, and to, to be with your children, to give you praise, to lift you high, to make you number one, to sing about how good you are, to love on you, and then, Lord, to feel your love as well. And so, Lord, as we give today, we do so with joyful hearts, uh, not because we're pressured, but, Lord, we do so because uh, we want to. We love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.
it out, church. Let him hear you. Okay, just you. Holy, holy, Corinthians 11, 23 through 30 shows us three things about communion. First, we should look back in remembrance of Christ and how he died on the cross for us. Second, we should look ahead until he comes again. Third is when we look within. This is a very intimate time with God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for sending your son to save our lives and give us that choice and that chance to live forever with you for eternity. We are not worthy, but we thank you for this so much. Take some time with the Lord.
shall we? Lord, we truly do come before you today and we surrender all, not because of what we can do, but because of what you have done and because we trust what you have done. We simply say thank you for your son Jesus and the incredible work that he did on the cross, making a way back to yourself. It's in his precious name that we pray this morning and all of God's kids said, amen. Well, good morning. You can have a seat. Well, how is everybody doing today? Somebody said that it was snowing outside. Is that right? Snow. Hmm. Well, get out your bulletins, would you, real quick? There's a lot of stuff going on around here. As you can see, we've got the wall behind us. Uh, isn't that amazing what they can do in a week? Yeah. Yeah, we're really excited about it. And it actually doesn't do too bad for, for a projector screen. You know, it's okay. It does all right. Uh, but blessed are the flexible, right? So we're doing the best we can. And uh, uh, hopefully by sometime next week, uh, we'll have maybe something else hung up behind us, but we're glad to have the wall up. And there's other things going on around here. Um, we've got men's breakfast on Tuesday mornings. We just started a, a study in, in Acts, which is exciting. Um, there's women's Bible study on the same day, uh, both morning and night. Um, all kinds of neat things going on around here. But uh, we need some help in the tech ministry, if you guys are techie or know of somebody that's techie, either come see me or sign up at the information table, would you, or send me a quick email. My email's here in the bulletin. Um, all kinds of neat stuff going on. But the, the biggest thing that we wanted to highlight this weekend for you guys was um, this insert in the bulletin. This, you heard Tom talk about it last weekend, if you were here. The petition to stop taxpayer funding of abortion. It's a big deal. And I was, I was floored by some of the statistics that was given through this, that 3,600 lives per year uh, are girls and boys murdered with our taxpayer money. 
And I just, I mean, I don't know about you, but for a Christian, that's just wrong. And um, um, there's also some other statistics that you can read about here that are just devastating. But it also gives you a list of things that you can do. Um, you have a voice as a Christian believer. And uh, one of the ways that you can um, exercise that voice is you can go sign a petition. Um, Karen or Karen and Randall are at a table right over here by our information center, and they've got petitions laid out there. You can sign your name there, and it's just to get something on the ballot so that we can try to put an end to this. Um, so if that speaks to you, please do that afterwards. Um, also wanted to give you an update uh, on a, one of our precious families that uh, went through a terrible tragedy a couple weeks ago. They lost their, their little girl, Maddie, uh, was killed in the car wreck. And uh, Jason and Jordan um, are at home now. And their other little girl who was in the, in the car wreck as well, uh, Aria, is back home. She's out of ICU, so praise God for that. And I got a text from Jason last night uh, that said, you know, we're just, we're doing okay, but we're just taking one day at a time. And so you can imagine losing a child is never uh, a natural thing for us. And so please be praying for and uh, lifting that family up as they go through their struggle of grief, uh, enormous grief. It, the other thing that I wanted to mention to you is that through your generosity, and this is a big deal as well, uh, we were able to raise $3,200 last weekend alone to go towards their, their uh, yeah, go ahead, give yourself a, a, yeah. And we're not done yet, folks. If, if uh, you see a deacon running around with a green bucket in his hand, uh, that money will go towards the family because just in the first day alone, their hospital bill was $68,000. And so uh, you can imagine what that does to a family. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for your generosity. Continue to be generous and continue to pray for these, these lovely folks who are suffering. Okay? All right. So 20 weeks ago, we embarked on a journey as a church here at Grace Point. Uh, a journey in this book right here, the story. Does everybody have one? Everybody should have one by now. We've been saying it every weekend. If you don't have one, get one. Uh, we have ordered and reordered and reordered, and we're still out. They've flown off the shelves so much. But the folks who put this book together did some research and found that between all of the denominations and non-denomination uh, churches alike. Um, the biggest problem in modern day churches is biblical illiteracy. And so it was out of that need that this book was put together. And I'm very thankful as a church leader that a couple of guys like Max Lucado and Randy Frazee uh, chose to put this book together. I remember <clears throat> just a little over a year ago when we first moved into this building, we had one of our first staff meetings, and where Pastor Tom shared with the staff that God had put something on his heart, and that something was that there was some kind of a comprehensive biblical study that we could all do together as a church, um, as one body, as one heart, and that's the entire church, not just the adults, but the kids and the youth and the adults. We could all study the same word together, the same place in the Bible. And if you haven't been with us for the past several weeks, let me bring us up to speed a little bit. A couple of weeks ago, we learned that through the idolatry practices of the nation of Judah, God allowed a Babylonian king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar to take captive its people. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city and the temple of God along with it. And we learned about the exile of a man named Daniel through that story. And even more so, we learned about King Nebuchadnezzar and how he thought of himself as a god. And we also learned what the true God of the universe thinks about that. God makes it very clear that he is the center of the universe, not us. Amen? 
And last week we learned about the promise that God had made to his people about going home. That after 70 years of being held in captivity in Babylon, the Lord said this in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. He said, you'll be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things that I have promised. And I will bring you home again. Doesn't that sound nice? To be brought home again? That verse reminds me of another verse in the New Testament. John chapter 14, verse 3, reads like this. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Doesn't that sound nice? That was Jesus, by the way. <laughs> Tom asked the question last week. He said, what's the big deal about the temple? And whether we're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, the answer is the same. Our Creator longs to be with His creation. And so God makes a way. That's the main theme of this book. God always making a way to bring us back to himself. And so the people are allowed to come home and they are instructed to build this temple. And what happens? Well, what happened is what always happens. <laughs> the people, they lost focus. They got distracted. They got off track. They forgot Anybody resemble that remark here today? And it's not that we have this intentional, vindictive, um, purposeful hatred towards God. It's not that way at all. Edmund Burke put it this way. He said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil to prevail is that good men do what? Nothing. You see, we just forget. And so the lesson for us last week was to turn from our indifference and to go back to our first love. Now next week, we're going to read about a guy named Nehemiah who did just that. Nehemiah was in one of the highest positions in the kingdom's court at that time. He was the, the cupbearer to the king. And it was the highest level of security at that time. Kind of like being, I don't know, Secret Service or something. And Nehemiah gets a report from his brother about how bad things are going in Jerusalem, which was his first love. And how through Nehemiah, God rebuilds the walls to the city. It's a great story. But this week, our assignment lies in chapter 20. And it's, it's a great story as well. It's one of my favorite. It's the story of Esther. And I love Esther. The book of Esther reads almost like a good Disney movie, right? It's got a king, it's got a couple of queens in there, it's got a villain, it's got a, a hero, um, it's got a plot that, uh, that has all of the elements of, of tension and release and, and heightened moments of great fear with the possibility of tragedy for a large number of people only to be followed by relief and ultimate victory over evil. Not because of human ingenuity, not because of, of human technology or even human wealth, and certainly not because of a man in a red cape, <laughs> but because of God's uncanny ability to use the unassuming as a savior. The story of Esther confirms the great upper story of God. Over and over we have seen God's faithfulness in spite of idolatry, in spite of barrenness, in spite of sin and rebellion, disobedience and poor choice after poor choice. God has sovereignly led his people and now he illustrates again through the story of Esther that nothing will stop his plan of redemption through Israel. 
We've seen this truth time and time again through the Old Testament. One of the main points that I want us to get from today's message is this, that God is still working even when we cannot see his plan. Right? God was working his plan even while Joseph was in prison. God was working his plan while Moses escaped slaughter as a baby. God was working his plan even while calling Gideon out of hiding. God was working his plan even while Samson was blinded and made to be a spectator sport. God was working his plan while Saul was gunning for David. He was working his plan while the kingdom was split into two. He was working his plan even during captivity in Babylon. And God was working his plan as Persia took over and allowed the Jews to return home. Let me say this again, church. When we cannot see his plan, when we cannot hear his voice, when we cannot feel his presence, God is still working his plan. We sing a song here called Hallelujah, You Are Good, written by Stephen Curtis Chapman, one of my favorites. And in the course of this song, it says, When faith gives way to fear, I will trust your heart. I will trust your heart. And when I cannot feel you near, I will trust your heart. I will trust your heart. What's that song really saying? It's, it's saying that when it all falls down around me, when my, when my prayers fall flat, when there's this sense of deep, maybe even traumatic loss like the Baileys are suffering right now, when you can't answer the why question. When I'm smack dab in the middle of a faith crisis, I'm going to choose to trust the heart of God Almighty, the creator of the universe, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen? So, let's meet the characters of this story, shall we? When King Nebuchadnezzar took captive the people of Judah, there was a man named Mordecai, a descendant of King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, whose family was exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. And we're told that some of Mordecai's relatives had died during that time, leaving behind a daughter named Hadassah. Now, Hadassah was Mordecai's cousin, and described as a very beautiful and lovely girl. And the Bible tells us that Mordecai adopted Hadassah and raised her as his own daughter. Mordecai was a good man. Unlike the men of his time, Mordecai had some different set of priorities. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of deep honor and wisdom. Even when there was a conspiracy to kill the king, Mordecai came against it and would later be rewarded by God for his sense of loyalty. Mordecai had a tender heart. And we see in this story how he loved Hadassah with a father's love. How he guided, guarded, and protected her as any good father would. He put godly values into this little girl that would later be called upon. Some scholars would say that in Mordecai's attempt to protect Hadassah, he changed her name to Esther in order to keep her Jewish heritage a secret, her nationality under wraps. Because see, if men in Babylon ever found out that she was Jewish, she would be treated very differently. And it was during this time that a king by the name of Xerxes was in power. And Xerxes was, in a lot of ways, no different than 
the other kings that were before him. He had a lot of the same poor priorities. King Xerxes valued his money. He valued his riches. He valued his wine. The Bible is very clear about his hunger for the opposite sex and the exploitation of women in his kingdom. In fact, we're even told that his wife at the time, Queen Vashti, was ordered by him to parade herself in front of the nobles, and the Bible says, all of the other men during a banquet that Xerxes had been giving. And in short, and this is my opinion, you may disagree, or you might agree, but my opinion is that King Xerxes was a narcissistic show-off, and Queen Vashti was nothing more than arm candy. Right? A, to- a trophy wife, if you will. And you see, King Xerxes was the kind of guy that wanted everyone in his kingdom to know that he had the most and he had the best. It was important to him. And the Bible doesn't tell us why, but for some reason, Vashti refuses to come and do this, to parade herself in front of all these men. And I say, you know, good for her. But this infuriated the king. And so Xerxes consults with his nobles, seven of them to be exact, and they come up with this decree. Now, for those of you who don't know, back in the the times of the Persians and the Medes, when a king set forth a decree, it became law, and it was a law that was irrevocable. You couldn't take it back. This decree said that since Queen Vashti disobeyed her husband, the king, that she should be banished from the king and from the kingdom forever. And that the king should choose another queen more worthy than Vashti. And so he does. Through this decree, King Xerxes has all of the young, beautiful women of Babylon brought to him. And that includes Esther. And she is chosen to be queen. Now, after becoming queen, Esther is presented with this life situation in which she has the opportunity to make some choices. And in considering those choices, she chose to seek God through fasting, through prayer, through wise counsel. And because she listened and chose well, her people were saved from genocide. That's pretty much the basic premise of the entire book of of Esther. And because God chose to share his upper story through this book, we now have the privilege to see a glimpse of the Messiah through Esther. The parallels between Esther and Jesus are nothing short of amazing. The name Esther means star. Jesus describes himself as the bright morning star in Revelation. Both displayed God's beauty. Both were attacked by the evil one who sought to destroy them. And both sought the Lord's will. God used both Esther and Jesus to deliver his people from death and destruction. Esther, chapter 7, verse 3, Esther says, I ask that my life and the lives of my people are spared. Jesus, just before he dies on the cross, says this, It is finished. What was finished? The incredibly hard work of defeating death and saving anyone who asks. Then there's the villain in the story, a guy by the name of Haman. When I think about a guy like Haman, I picture a guy like this. Take a look. Right? Jafar from Aladdin. That's who I see when I see this guy named Haman. Haman is the evil one in the story, right? The conniver, described as an enemy of the Jews. 
And his lineage, much like Mordecai, precedes him, only in a much different way. Haman is described as an Agagite. This means that he's a, a direct descendant of King Agag, the Amalekite. Do you guys remember that? You remember the story of the Amalekites from Deuteronomy? The Amalekites were, were the ones who were behind the Israelites as they left Egypt, right? And then later on, you remember what God told Saul to do with King Agag and the Amalekites in 1 Samuel? Remember that? He told him to destroy them. And I've even had people come up to me and say, man, that just seems really harsh, right? To just destroy a whole race of people. But, you know, God is sovereign and he knows evil when he sees evil. And there was a reason that he told, him, told Saul to destroy this race of people because God knows evil. 1 Samuel 15, 9 says that Saul spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle. You see, Saul was doing his own thing. And I want, to, want us to catch this this morning. Just open your minds up to a bigger period of time. Is it a coincidence that a direct descendant of Agag the Amalekite, which is Haman, and a direct descendant of King Saul, which is Mordecai, find themselves almost 565 years later at odds with each other? Interesting, isn't it? God gave a command. That command was disobeyed. And 565 years later, God's plan and desire to redeem his people is still in play. So, let's set the stage for the great upset, shall we? The moment of tension and tragedy for the Jews. Turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3. Esther is right before Saul, or Job, actually. Right, after, or right before Job. Esther chapter 3. Let me set this up for us. Haman has just been promoted by the king, making him the most powerful official in the empire at that time. And all of the king's officials would bow before Haman except one. Anybody care to guess which one wouldn't bow before him? Mordecai. Mordecai bowed in front of only one God. That was his Lord and Savior. And this didn't set well with Haman. And we pick up the story in verse 5 of chapter 3. Let's read along. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So, in the month of April, during the twelfth year of, the, of King Xerxes' reign, Lots were cast in Haman's presence. The lots were called Purim. To determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, There is a certain race of people scattered throughout all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people. And they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. Isn't that an interesting opinion to have? All of a sudden, Haman is, is, a, is an expert on this race of people. And so he tells the king his opinion. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. The king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. 
kind of a bad place to be in if you're of Jewish descent, isn't it? It appears as if the Jewish people are headed for genocide. But here's the cool thing. God's timing is always perfect, isn't it? Haman sets forth this decree to annihilate the Jews. And in chapter 4, Mordecai begins to freak out a little bit. And so Mordecai sends word to Queen Esther about Haman's plans of destruction to her people. And Esther replies in verse 10 of chapter 4. Follow along with me. Just the next chapter over. Verse 10. Then Esther told Hathak to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days, which by then it would be too late. So Hathak gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. For such a time as this. Have you ever felt like Esther? You ever been in that position before? Where on one hand, life's pretty good, right? Living in the palace. People tending to your needs and your wants. In fact, you've never had it so good. The best food, the finest clothing... Life is pretty lavish. But on the other hand, the most important thing to you, right, the thing that you love the most, your first love, stands to be destroyed. You ever find yourself in that position where the rubber is finally meeting the road right in front of your eyes and there's a choice to be made? This is where things like integrity Honor, moral value, humility, loyalty. They become the most important tools in the tool bag. All the things that Uncle Mordecai had put into this young girl would now be exercised. You ever been in that moment where the next choice that you make was for such a time as this? I would propose to us this morning, church, that the reason God used Esther to save the Jews was because Esther knew the value of a life submitted to God. Both Esther and Jesus exposed evil and were willing to die. Let's pick up in verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all of the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then catch this. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. Wow. If I must die, I must die. Who does that sound like? It sounds a lot like our Savior, doesn't it? Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Last week we heard 
Tom quote C.S. Lewis, who said, if we put first things first, then we get the second things thrown in, right? But if we put the second things first, we lose both first and second things. Esther knew what was important. And she put those important things first, which was people. And the second things were thrown in. Haman put Haman first. And he not only lost the first and second things, he lost everything. You see, the difference between people like Mordecai and Haman is that Mordecai was a man of integrity who put others before himself. And that's the crux of it, you guys. Haman would sell his own mother if he thought it would benefit him. Which leads me to an interesting question. Depending on who you are and what you stand for, right? King Xerxes in Esther 6, verse 6, asked a question. He said, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? And depending on who you are and what you stand for, determines the answer to that question. If you're the kind of person who seeks to serve self, then the answer to that question will only serve self. But if you're the kind of person who seeks to serve others first, then the answer to the question is much like C.S. Lewis's quote, except you get the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, Oh, and then there's eternity that gets thrown in too, right? Now, that's easy to say. But Tom and I have picked up this mantra that we like to say on a weekly basis around here. And it kind of goes like this. Life is hard, but God is good, right? It's not easy living the life here on earth. Life is hard, but God is good. And like Mordecai and Esther, they didn't quit in spite of the hard. Look, life doesn't get easy just because we become Christians, right? In fact, oftentimes, it's just the opposite. Right? The story of Esther... The story of uh, Daniel. The story of the kings and the prophets. The story of Saul, David, and Solomon. The story of Ruth. The story of Moses and Aaron and Joshua. story of Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and Jacob. The story of Noah. The story of Adam and Eve. The story of Jesus. Our story. Each one of these stories shows us the same thing. The pain and suffering are always the precursor to peace and joy. Maybe you're here today and you find yourself in the middle of your own story. Now you're probably not going to be called by God to save a whole race of people. But God knows where you're at. I'm going to sing a song. And there's going to be people down here in the front to pray with you if you need prayer today. Guys, look, if you don't know Jesus, 
as your Lord and Savior, don't leave today without making that decision. Come to the altar. And you don't have to leave. We have some time. Hang out with me. Sing a little bit. Spend some time with God this, this day. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wise? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And here's the crux of everything, guys. Listen to this. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Right? Amen? Go ahead. As you leave today, make sure you keep that in your heart. 
as you bear your cross daily just like Esther, don't forget to tell the world of the treasure of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love you guys. We'll see you back here next weekend.